Hi there, welcome back. And uh, welcome back to the last video in the series uh, of the restoration of the Telefocan Jubilate. A lot has been done. Some decisions have been made, some choices have been made. And I'll just uh, very briefly talk you through what has been done since the last video. And then we'll go on to uh, putting this all together and doing a final test. So, the uh, dreaded cabinet has been completed or is nearly completed and um, I've got everything ready to put together again obviously after having dismounted everything including the screws and we had quite a few things we needed to repair on here and I'll just uh, very briefly talk you through them the cabinet itself I decided to I finally decided to uh, sand it all down to the wood because I actually wanted a different tone to it. I wanted a matte um, color. I didn't particularly want the, um, you know, the fade or the burst that was on the original one. I know some people will get very angry with me for doing this, but this is the way I like it. My radio, my rules. So what was done here? Um, first of all, I took the old varnish off with uh, varnish remover which is a very messy messy process you paint this varnish remover on and then you um, scrape it off after a few minutes do it a few more times get all the varnish off and when you've got that done then the sanding starts and you have to sand very very carefully you have to do it with very fine grit paper I think I started this one on about 200 grit which uh, makes the work harder, but uh, it, it ensures that you don't remove the, uh, or don't sand through the veneer. It's a very thin veneer on the wood. The, the front parts, this, this sort of front section here is solid wood, and it's a lighter wood than the veneer on the flat portions, same with the back. But the veneer itself is very thin, and if you sand too much, you go right through it, and you end up with a white mark on there. So that was sanded down, then it was uh, prepped and, and varnished. I can't tell you how many layers this has received. What I do is I, I use water base, um, what is this? Uh, walnut, I think it is, walnut varnish. And I dilute it, and the first layer is very diluted, the second one is less diluted, and so on and so forth. And so it builds up slowly, and every time you do a layer, you let it dry, and you sand down with... Uh, water, um, what is it, emery paper, that uh, sandpaper, that the wet sandpaper. And then you start again, and so on and so forth. And the result, I'm very, very happy with. It's uniform. It doesn't have a gloss, which I don't want. I want a matte finish. It's very uniform. And that's exactly what I wanted from this. So that's the cabinet. And of course, just about everything was removed from here. I did not remove the inside brackets wasn't necessary. The inside got duly cleaned as well, but there was not much there. It was very, very uh, pristine, actually. Those brackets are fine. They were cleaned up. And so I'm very happy with the cabinet. Next, the speaker grill cloth. Well, that was a real mess. And what this is, it's a bit of uh, chipboard or whatever this stuff is called, particle board. That part is painted, spray painted gold, and then the actual um, grill cloth was stuck on there. The original one was slightly darker than this one, but I like the effect. I put this one on, it's glued with contact glue, contact adhesive, and then those holes there were burnt out, just like the original was with a soldering iron. Um, the back was cleaned out, so that thing is ready. Then we had to face the challenge of the, uh, the front cover, the grill, with, uh, which if you recall, was a big hole over here. And that was, a lot of these uh, grills were actually chipped and broken and stuck on pretty badly. So I had to redo them. It is not 100% perfect, but it's damn near enough. And I may, if I find a different procedure in the future, redo some of these points but um, I'm happy. This was actually filled in with, um, this was filled in with 
a um, resin and it actually came out the color of the remainder. It didn't come out uh, transparent or white or anything. It actually came out a cream, which from any sort of distance, you don't really, you can't really tell the difference. So I'm happy with the result. The rest is obviously cleaned up and it's ready to go. That uh, gold strip on the side was repainted on there. The way to do that is you paint it in excess and then you wipe it so that the edges clear up and the grill or rather the uh, freeze remains. And finally all the screws de-rusted and lubricated and ready to go. So next stage is to put this chassis or the cabinet back together. And here it is, the chassis is done. And um, as you can see it's why I chose that grill cloth, it actually fits very very well on here. Everything is fitting perfectly. Um, the contrast something I quite like. All the metal parts fitted on the back. Speaker connected in there with the original screws obviously de-rusted and all we need to do now is to solder this to the uh, to the chassis of the radio itself and we are good to go. But before we do that I will go back to the chassis of the radio itself and, um, and tell you what decisions I've made with regard to the outstanding bits that were still hanging around there. Okay, so first of all, the transformer is staying as it is. I have uh, thought about it and thought about it and I decided that it was going to stay as it is because if I put in a bigger transformer I'd end up with all sorts of problems here it was actually going to extend further back which uh, brought it closer to the output uh, tube and that could definitely induce more hum and noise so I decided to leave it there but just to make it safer what I've decided to do is put in a little indicator here that tells me when my plug is wired the wrong way around and that is very very simple I'll show you um, the schematic and also I'll show you how I installed it and I've just realized something, I'm going to change the way I've installed it, but I'll, I'll explain why. As regards everything else, the that little pin over there that goes to that, uh, I think it's 50 picofarad capacitor, to the mains, touching one of the antenna inputs, actually works very well. And the way you see it works very well is when you just use that with no other antenna, and you flip around with the mains cord, lift it higher and lower, make it horizontal, etc. You can actually tell the difference in reception and it receives pretty well. It's probably as good or better than the internal dipoles that some of the bigger radios have. I prefer to use an external antenna but it does allow me to, I can flip it off away from either of the uh, two antenna pins or I can just flip it back onto one if I choose. I'm going to be changing the uh, capacitor that connects that point internally uh, to the mains. At the moment I've got a 50 picofarad um, a silver mica cap. I'm waiting for uh, the Y caps that I've ordered. Very strange values, very small values, difficult to get. But they tell me they're sending me one so or a few. So um, I'm waiting for that. The other thing I'm waiting for is a 47 or 20, 22 nanofarad uh, Y cap as well um, because I need to sort that out. That one there is just a film cap. So even though I'm going to put this all together and put it in the chassis in the cabinet and complete it effectively there's still a couple of things to to do here. Now fortunately it's actually very very easy to remove this, uh, this uh, chassis from the cabinet. It just slides out of those um, those two rails. Um, so it shouldn't be a problem. The other thing that I want to point out is the tuning. Right. As I mentioned in the previous video, I don't have a service manual for this. I don't know exactly where the coils are of the, or rather the, uh, the windings of the transformers. I don't know which transformers which, I can guess. Especially the last one, the FM, which I believe is that guy. I'm not sure, but I believe it's that guy. 
I don't know whether the um, primary is below and the secondary above or vice versa. And that's important because that will implicate um, or that will imply that I'm not sure whether I'm tuning the discriminator or not, or rather the ratio detector or not, to null it out. And this thing is receiving so well, AM and FM, that I'm loath to mess around with it. I may do in the future. I'm waiting for a set of tools, the hexagonal, hexagonal, hexagonal ones, um, which at the moment all I've got is a metal one. It's this thing over here. Now, that's no good because it's metal. So um, when you put it into the cores, it affects it. I've ordered some uh, plastic or ceramic ones. Hopefully the right size will come. That's a strange size actually, but we shall see. Fortunately, it's not a crucial decision right now because it's receiving very well. So next step, let me show you how I've put in the protection circuit for the mains the hot chassis indicator. You may have noticed that I've changed the wire. This is a three core wire, mains wire, and I'll show you on the underside how I've wired it up and why. So this thing actually has um, the live, the neutral and the earth coming through here from the wall plug. Obviously the earth is not connected to chassis, okay, because one of the Others is connected to chassis. Hopefully the neutral, and that's the whole point. We want to know for sure before we really start using this thing, once you've plugged it in, that we actually do have the chassis at neutral rather than having the chassis at live. Okay, and this little indicator is very, very simple and you can actually do it a lot simpler than I've done. Does the job pretty well. Okay, so what we want to do, we can't avoid a possible hot chassis in, in our uh, main system in Portugal and a few other places because our uh, sockets are not polarized at all. Um, so what we have coming into the radio, we've got our live, goes into a switch, the on off switch at the front, right? We've got our neutral, which goes to the same switch different pole of the same switch and that's all we have and the neutral is connected directly to chassis that's a hot chassis system in this particular case that's exactly how it works now the danger is that if you get these two reversed if you happen to have neutral at the top and live at the bottom you're in trouble because your live goes straight to the chassis. If you touch any metal on the chassis, you can get zapped. And although this particular radio um, is actually very well protected, very little metal from the chassis is accessible from the outside. Uh, the actual only main danger points are the screws that tie in or that uh, tighten the tuning knobs to the, to the shafts of the pots and the, and the uh, tuning shaft. If you do touch that, you could get zapped. It's difficult to touch it, but hey, when you've got kids playing around something like this, they'll find a way. So what I've done is, as opposed to having just live and neutral coming in, two wires, I've now got three wires, and my three wires include earth. That's the three wire mains cord that I've got there. That is connected to that mains earth. That comes in. And what I've done is I've created an indicator from the chassis, between the chassis and earth. What I really want to do is to, if I measure the voltage between the chassis and earth, I should get zero volts because if it's correct, then the chassis is at neutral and the voltage difference between neutral and earth may be a couple of volts. So I shouldn't get a high voltage. But if I measure it between earth and live, I get 230 volts, full mains. So what I need to do is I need to measure the voltage between the chassis and the earth at all times to make sure that the chassis is never at 230 volts. And the way to do that, you could have a voltmeter and spend all your time touching things together, but you can put an indicator in and you can do it in many ways. Um, you can have a, a simple resistor and a neon lamp. Good enough. Put a resistor in line, current limiting resistor, and you can put a neon lamp in here 
the neon lamp works at about 90 volts. The way to measure the current, you make it one milli milliamp going through there. So 230 minus 90 divided by one milliamp gives you the resistance uh, that you want there. What I've done is I've gone one step further. I um, I actually saw a very interesting video by BigClive.com and I'll try and remember to link that in the description below where he shows various types of indicators using LEDs. And you have to be careful with LEDs because if you do that and you put an LED straight down to earth and you have 220 volts or 230 volts across it, um, you limit the current, but uh, what you can do is you can reverse, you, your reverse voltage across the LED will be high and it'll blow the LED. Usually they take about 5 volts, except if you've got the really old ones, but we won't go into that. He shows in that video various ways of uh, creating a, an indicator. Um, and the best one that I like is actually with a full bridge rectifier. So that's exactly what I've done. I've used one of those, uh, the round bridge rectifiers, uh, in, in, a, in one package and I'll be showing you that in a minute but the circuit is basically like this if you have the bridge rectifier in here you've got minus there and plus there what you do is you put an LED and I've actually put in two LEDs in series and what happens now is when this thing is live, when the chassis is live, there's 220 volts, 230 volts over there, zero volts over here, current flows down here through the diodes, across the LEDs and down to ground. When the uh, polarity of the uh, mains wave is, in, is reverse, current goes from there, up there, through the diodes and up there and up to the chassis. So whenever the chassis is live, in other words, when I've plugged this in the wrong way, these two LEDs will light up. And I've used ultra bright LEDs. I've used two in series to get a bit more brightness. The actual current limiting resistor I've used is 220K. The current going through there is about one milliamp because the way you work this out is uh, 230 volts minus the voltage drop across the LEDs, which is about two volts each. So minus four volts, minus two voltage drops for the rectifier. So it's basically 230 volts minus 10 volts or something. So 220 volts uh, divided by 220K, 1 milliamp, and it actually lights up brightly enough that you can see it. And where I've placed it is actually uh, out of the way, but visible when you switch on the radio, radio. I have made one mistake, and that is that if I've plugged this in the wrong way, the LEDs will light when I switch on the radio, okay? I can actually do it differently. I can actually and should actually put this connection here to this part before the switch. In other words, instead of connecting this directly to the chassis, which becomes live if this is wrong after I switch on, I can actually connect this to the live neutral wire coming in, just where it solders to the switch. And that means that the minute I plug it in the wall, even before I power the radio, in other words, before I've actually uh, created a hot chassis, I can tell whether I've wired, wired it the wrong way around. And that'll make it safer even than the one I've got now. What I have now at the, at the moment is it's going to chassis. I'm going to change that around and make it go to the switch. And I'll show you the underside, how I've wired it up. And um, it's just something that you, you need to know that it's there and you need to know that if you see a red glow on the underside, you know there's something wrong. Um, so let me show you what's done. So what we have here is we've got the uh, three core wire coming in here, the mains plug, from the mains plug. The earth is that green one. That goes to one of those wires there. The um, other one, the other one from there, comes down and it's connected to the chassis. Now that's the one I'll be swapping around and I will actually be wiring this, soldering it to there. So that will be the neutral before the switch as opposed to after the switch. If you remember, that point there, after you switch it on, connects to the chassis. So I'll be wiring that around. And the actual uh, indicator is just up here. The way I've done it is I've put the two LEDs, wired them 
to the plus in series, wired them to the plus and minus uh, outputs of the bridge rectifier. And then the uh, resistor is in series with one line of the AC points of the rectifier. He shrunk them and with the cable tie, I've tied it to that uh, selenium diode. And it's under the faceplate, if you can see that, it's not going to be affecting anything, it's not going to be touching anything, impeding the tuning I've checked. And when I switch on the radio, it'll show me with the red glow on the faceplate that I've got something wrong. And I can actually show you that right now. I've got this thing on, as you can see. At the moment, it's actually connected to the uh, isolation transformer. But if I do that, it takes it down to mains. And there we go. We've got a red glow on there. It's actually quite a lot brighter from the underside or from the front side, if you look at it. But you can see the glow. And you have to be careful because the chassis, at the moment, is at 220 volts, 230 volts. So the chassis is live. Now I want to show you what happens when I flip the plug around. Now if you look at that little guy over there, I've got to be careful I don't touch this. It's red. Take the plug out, flip it around. It's now off. And it's safe. And <laughs> it's always a, a leap of faith to touch it, but yeah, the chassis is not live anymore. So that thing is the way I want it. I'm going to, as I said, turn around so that it, um, because if, if I switch it off, uh, if it was dangerous, uh, it won't show me before I switch it on. Okay. So I'm going to flip that around and I'll be ready to go. Other than that, this thing is cleaned up. It's lubed. It's uh, made as safe as it's going to be. I need to just uh, swap that out. Um, I need to solder the speaker wires onto here and then we'll be able to do a test of the final result. And finally here she is. Completely done. Back into the cabinet. Everything wired up. Everything screwed in. Cleaned with the exception of a few grains of dust there. And it's come out absolutely beautifully. The woodwork is just the way I wanted it. It's a bit more modern than the, um, the original, which will probably distress some aficionados, but uh, this is the way I wanted it. And I'm really, really pleased. Everything cleaned up absolutely beautifully. The faceplate is perfect. There's only a few irregularities on that front grille, as I mentioned before. But this is it. This is what the hobby is all about. I want to show you how that um, indicator lamp works, the hot chassis indicator. I have purposely put this in the wrong way and I'm going to switch it on and if you look down here you should see the red tint. There we go, see that? Now it's off, now it's on. So we know that that is the wrong way. We've got a hot chassis at the moment. I'm going to flip the plug around, just take it out and back in. And as you can see, it's gone. Now the radio is not on yet, so I've been able to get an indication of any danger before actually powering the radio. What this meant was that if I did switch it on, the chassis would become hot. So now we know that it's safe and we can put it on normally and get on with it. Su participación en Twin Peaks. Sigue la competición, el fútbol en primera división, Manuel Zapata.
apostamos al Barcelona Getafe en Sporting.es. La victoria del conjunto azulgrana se paga 1,53 por euro apostado y si apuesta tiene... <risa> alternativa de, de los demás, en este caso de Ferrari, que digamos son sus competidores directos. Y yo creo que lo que ha ocurrido es que hoy Hamilton, eh, después de la, de la última victoria de Bota, la victoria de Bota, perdón, él... de 13 años en la década de 1990. Con gol para la formación romana, bien trabajado este lance, fue Esteki Alam Karam, Esteki quien fez el gol. Los ministros de exteriores de la Unión Europea van a discutir mañana en los próximos pasos para tratar de mantener la situación para que se Ello a pesar de que el gobierno de Nicolás Maduro mantiene su rechazo a nuevas elecciones. Una intervención militar extranjera para derrocarle. Según fuentes diplomáticas, la situación es extremadamente difícil políticamente. Operación militar. Guaidó no ha sido un éxito. Y el régimen de Nicolás Maduro duro. Ha detenido al vicepresidente de la Asamblea Nacional, Edgar Zamp. Se de traición, insurrección y rebelión a una decena de diputados. Del gobierno de Maduro para aumentar la presión. Pero no ha habido ninguna expresión de euforia ni mucho. Eso no nos salva, sino que nos, nos hace. Hubiéramos firmado una situación de ese tipo. Ya saben que el Celta Rayo. Nacional. Mañana Fundación a tres media llevará a cabo.
cidade e a saúde, é, que nos faz sorrir todos os anos e agradecer este momento tão... Well, that's it for me. Um, this project is done and um, it's always a bit, there's always a bit of procrastination when I get near the end because I start missing it before it's actually gone. But um, thank you for your patience. If you've been following the series, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned something. I certainly have. I always do. When I do a project, there's always something new to try and uh, figure out. And um, if you enjoy this series and if you enjoy my videos, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up and do the sharing and all that jazz. It certainly helps. And uh, thanks for watching once again. Bye for now.